Hey everybody. So I'm going to make a response video here about a comment I got to one of my videos. And the comment was along the lines of to not work with Buddhist entities because there's a chance, a danger of losing my mind. And also that Enochian and Buddhism are incompatible in his view. So, okay. Um, I'm just going to say that to make such a statement about a broad class of entities that you may not have worked with, chances are, I'm just going to say it, I don't think this person has worked with them. I don't think this person has worked with entities in general, but okay, maybe I'm wrong. But to make that statement that you're more likely to go crazy with a Buddhist entity over an Enochian one kind of flies into the face of the reputation of Enochian as being that system that will make you lose your mind, right? And I've been asked this on multiple podcasts. It's the reputation. Now, I will say this from somebody, a couple of colleagues, I, I feel comfortable calling them that, Scott Stenwick and uh, another person who goes by the nickname of Freighter F Disc, and you find him on Twitter and stuff like that. And this isn't new. And by the way, I won't call it that other name. It's always Twitter, and it's a shame that Twitter is dying, right? But he... Scott Stenwick is of the view that you know, there's a base rate of mental illness in the population and that there's no causal studies and that he hasn't found a higher percentage of people who work with Enochian who go crazy versus anything else. FDISC is of a slightly different view. His view is that he's seen too many magicians go off the rails. I mean, I can say that working with entities in general can be euphoric. And for that reason, you have to be careful and cautious and mature. And deliberate, which is not to say don't do it. There are advantages to working with entities. You just have to sort of be careful. Mainly from the effects, not necessarily anything that they're telling you. So if you get something, if you get a high from something, okay, don't necessarily act like everything is different. Everything is a little different. Maybe it's a lot different even, is fair to say. But the thing to do then is to exercise prudence. <laughs> Why is Solomon considered one of the best kings in the Bible? He sought wisdom first. And there's this old um, hymn, you know, seek ye first the wisdom of God uh, and his righteousness and all these things, wealth, health, blessings of all various kinds, will also be added unto you, will be added to those two things unto you, right? So I think that's the main thing, right? Working a spiritual system, whether it's exoteric Christianity or esoteric, such as Enochian, or Judaism or esoteric Judaism, which includes a lot of angels and stuff like that. The main thing that you, and, and any spiritual practice that, let's say, includes yoga, I'm very sensitive to energy, by the way, so like, um, I will feel it. And it feels, it can feel really good, right? Great, wonderful. So what do you do with that? Hmm, right? So let me do a slight pivot over to talk about Buddhism. But let me wrap that up by saying, be wise, be prudent, don't blow up your life, and then realize, okay, now that you understand that reality is a little bit different from how you thought about it, what do you do? And the angels always said, to love each other. It was a very Christian mes message. Love each other. Love, love, love. <laughs>
So I'm going to come back to Christianity, but I do want to speak a little bit about wisdom and compassion and how that relates to both Christianity and Buddhism. So Solomon was considered the best of the kings because he sought wisdom. And Christ, he sort of took that to the next level by saying Jesus was all about wisdom and compassion, right? Now, I'll say one thing, you don't get wisdom by being arrogant. And the comment that I got was pretty arrogant. It was very much a know-it-all, I know everything kind of comment about Buddhist entities. And also Enochian too, for what it's worth. Um, so wisdom and compassion, that's what Jesus is known for. And he saw it, his, the way he talked was he would get asked questions and he would respond and he would encourage people who he could recognize something in to follow him. But he was not what you would call an authoritarian guy. <laughs> okay. And he was certainly not about, you know, follow these, these very strict rules you know, he had things to say about wealth and power and how we can have a better society that's based on love. But for the most part, you know, he was very learned when it came to the law. And what I mean is the, the Jewish law at the time. And he was very, he spoke with a lot of wisdom. Okay. So, and his number one thing to follow was love and compassion. Now, generally speaking, wisdom and compassion are considered the two wings, basically, towards enlightenment. It's like two wings on a bird. And through those two, flapping those two wings together, you can actually reach enlightenment in Buddhist traditions. You know, it's, it's very common. And this is across the major schools of Buddhism, by the way. Now, those who work a Vajrayana path, which is one that I'm on, I follow a dual path. Those who, work, who follow that path understand that when they are working with an entity, they are cultivating with themselves, within themselves those two qualities with certain emphasis on certain manifestations of how that would go. It could be healing, it could be driving out negative tendencies within oneself or, or anything like that, right? The whole point, though, is I'm not just doing such and such to get healthy. I'm not doing such and such so I don't have to deal with nonsense in my life. Instead, it's the end goal is not those things in and of themselves, but to help all sentient beings no longer suffer. And why? Because, well, first of all, you know, I would argue that's it's probably good in and of itself, but you get compassion from realizing that another person has a mind and an existence that's very similar to yours. And you don't seek, you know, some people, somebody who might be into uh, pain for pleasure's sake, I wouldn't argue that they are suffering, <laughs> okay? But true suffering is not something anybody wants, right? You might have grown as a result of that, but really we would all, if we had two paths in front of us, one is growing is growing, you know, and having suffering be the vehicle versus the other one growing the same amount without suffering in the same amount of time, all things being equal, you're not going to pick the one that's suffering. Why? Because it's not fun. <laughs> okay. True suffering is not like that. So, but wisdom and compassion, those are the two wings of the bird towards enlightenment. Now, I'm not going to like harp on this person too much. I'm just saying that the statements were basically from a mind that didn't, and I'm not saying that it's a lesser mind or anything like that. I'm saying it's, it's they're born out of just not knowing. That's what ignorance means. It's not knowing. 
Okay, so they just didn't know. And so the main thing is, is that if you don't know, you don't need to speak on something as if you do. Or if you think you might know, or you might not know enough, it would might be wise to not speak on something out of compassion for roughly, I don't know, maybe I want to say it's in the hundreds of millions. I want to say it's seven, eight, nine hundred million people who consider themselves Buddhist. 10% of the population, that's a lot. So it's probably wise not to offend or alienate any number of those people and to recognize that if they're doing this thing and you're one person with your own point of view and everybody else is, you know, and you've got that many people, have you talked with three of them? Have you talked with 10 of them? Have you talked with two of them? Two people who actually work with Buddhist entities. It would be wise to do so before you make a statement about what those entities are like based on this other idea that you have, based on what some other idea about what Buddhism is from other groups of people, right? Because I can say anything. I could say anything about what it's like to live in Australia right now, but I don't live there. I don't know. Why would I say anything about that? Except from other Australians, maybe, you know, and just to talk about what they've said. Okay, enough about that. Now, I want to move a little bit into my own personal experience and why I'm a little sensitive to this. So I grew up in fundamentalist Christianity. And even though I personally, then as now, really hold dear Christ's teachings about love, loving your neighbor as yourself and loving God completely and utterly right? That means loving his creation. That means loving everybody and every sentient thing within it. it means loving it. So if you're coming at things from a place of love, what it should lead to is no matter who you come across is to deep down fundamentally love them, right? Even if you dislike them, even if they irritate you, even if they've hurt you, you still love them. And I don't think that that part really held up in the face of the more fundamentalist side of what you need to do if you are a fundamentalist Christian. And in my case, it included a lot of end times theology, right? Basically, a lot of fundamentalist Christianity was bringing in a lot of the Old Testament rules and strictures and patriarchy and all of those things that subtly or not put some people above others, some people as more worthy of power and love. And when I say love, power resources, because with power comes resources, and therefore worthy of loving by giving them things that they need to survive over others. And moreover, allowing a lot of people to maybe we don't worry about them as much, right? So as an example, if they don't believe the same way you do, well, you know, that's too bad. And maybe we can think that they're just so bad that they're going to go to hell. And that maybe we don't even need to be a good person because we've got the right beliefs, right? We believe in Jesus Christ. We're not going to necessarily pay attention to the greatest commandment, which is to love, right? 
So if somebody is gay, we'll, we'll put them over here. If there's trans, we'll also put them over here. If maybe, maybe you're a guy at the top of the system. So even though you don't want to say it, you'll put women over there too, right? Or children. Because the main thing is, is that God created power and you're all about the power, even though the main power that God spoke about uh, was love, right? It's very easy in that sort of system to not be heart focused, to not move starting at a place of the heart. It's very easy. And I have seen it in subtle ways. I've seen it in blatant ways where love did not come first. And I'm just going to say that as a human being, that is, you are giving up the holiest of your birthrights if you are putting anything other than love first. So, So I'm just going to speak generally just about my experience working with all kinds of entities, and then I'll let you go. My experience with Enochian entities is that they are hyper-focused on getting you to develop, bringing out a, a true perception of reality, and they're doing it out of love. Buddhist entities, they're very focused on working your entire subtle body system so that you can be more perceptive of things. And they're doing it out of love and compassion and wisdom. Same thing, wisdom also for the Enochian entities. I felt it went without saying, but it doesn't, so I'll say it. And also they are, they're very intelligent. I would say that for the, the Buddhist entities as well, very intelligent. There's a reason why I'm drawn to each of them. Um, Egyptian entities, very, very profound, very holy. I would say that for the Enochian angels and the, the Buddhist Yadams and, and so on and so forth. But there's a, a profound, a profundity to those. And they're happy to work with you. And I'm not going to say that they're not loving. I'm going to say that anybody who's willing to work with you on something and doesn't really <laughs> require anything back, they're doing you a favor. So they are, do they're, do they're implicitly showing love. Okay. And that's been my experience with, with, uh, Thoth or Tahuti or however you pronounce the name you choose, you choose to pronounce the name or Heka. Those are, those are the two I, who I've worked with. I haven't worked with Bastet or any of the rest, but they're implicitly showing you love, okay, by doing that, by helping you out. I've worked with the Greek pantheon. I've worked with, um, and, and Roman as well. I've worked with Jupiter, and I've worked with Iacus, and I've worked with Saturn in the Roman pantheon again, and I've worked with, I think those are the main ones, and Athena to a degree. I've worked with some of the Norse pantheon, I've worked with Freya in particular. And as far as the Hindu pantheon goes, I've worked with Ganesh. I've not worked with him in the Buddhist form as Ganapati, but that would probably be something that I do. And I've worked with, my experience in the Enochian Aether of Zip was that the daughter of Fortitude, as she's known to John Dee and Edward Kelly, Crowley called her Babylon, a name that I do not prefer, but that the entity in that, I just call her the daughter of Fortitude, she was very much... Uh, a Shakti 
like figure out of Hinduism. And Hinduism is really a large, a very large, diverse group of emphases out of the out of the Vedic tradition. So that's a lot. <laughs> and I've worked with the Shemham Farash angels, who are much more directly out of the Jewish tradition. Okay. All of them I have found have been very helpful in offering what they have to offer. In terms of developing yourself, I would say that any one of those entities will offer something for your development. So what we really need is wisdom and prudence and discernment in terms of what that is. And as long as you are seeking that wisdom and discernment, etc., if you're if you're you're exercising that from a place of compassion towards not only yourself, and by the way, you may need it towards yourself, but also other people and all sentient beings, frankly. And that requires a lot of investigation too, because there's a lot about other sentient beings we don't know. But what I would say is as long as you're exercising that wisdom and wisdom for what how it is you need to develop from a place of compassion you really won't go wrong so main takeaways are be kind to yourself be kind to others it's okay to not know about something it's even better if you don't know about something to not say you do or if you and to recognize that you probably don't know enough to say about something to speak about something and to ask questions and to listen. All of those things are wonderful. And to really work on loving, even when it's hard, especially when it's hard. And I would say that it's worthwhile. Okay. Now, does that take work? Of course it does. I come, I came from an angrier place after having been raised in that, uh, in that belief system, because, you know, it was all about the end of the world and nothing and about fear. And I felt like a lot of my life had not been healthy and it hadn't. Um, so in that case, just try to love and to let go of anger and do that long work. Because I can say that when you get to the end, it is so worth it. It's so worth it to have softened your heart towards yourself, towards another person, towards an animal on the street. All of that is worth it. You know, little stray dog comes by. If you have a, a nice warm feeling towards that, you know, now obviously if it's, you know, you want to make sure it's safe and all of that, but, you know, if it comes by, you know, you should care about that. You should care about a lot of stuff. Does it mean you can do everything? No. But it doesn't mean that you say, I'm not going to care. Or that I'm going to, I'm going to shut it out of your awareness, right? And it's tough in this world. There's a lot, you can get compassion fatigue really easily. Anyway, I know this kind of went all over the place. Um, and maybe it's, a, it's good that it did. But I think I wanted more than just what I initially replied, which was, you know, that I was sorry to that person that, you know, they weren't a fan of my beliefs, which is relatively polite, I suppose, but I feel like I didn't say enough. So now I've said it. Love each other, seek out wisdom, soften your heart, and learn, be open. Be prudent, discern, 
the biggest one comes, the biggest lesson comes from Jesus when he was talking about this very topic about false prophets, right? How do we know that this thing that we're believing in, he was speaking specifically about prophets, but any belief, how do you know? Ye shall know them by their fruits, right? Now, if you have somebody screaming at you to hate somebody else because they're this, they're that, they're the other thing, they're gay, they're a woman, they're a different race from you, they speak a different language. Those are all like trivial differences. And in terms of like a fundamental thing, obviously the lived experience can be way different. But in terms of like how that actually makes you different from somebody else, in terms of the heart, there is zero difference. None. Okay. So what fruits are your, is your heart producing? Hmm? Are you angry? Are you bitter? Are you empowered? Are you loving? These are some questions to ask. And if you don't know the answers, you know, you can try to introspect or try to do automatic journaling or anything like that to get in touch with you. And you can also ask people, people who you trust, people who you know you, who you know, you think that they're, that they're a good person. Maybe talk to somebody who you think is a great person, assuming that you really know them, right? And, and really can rely on their judgment and know that they will be honest with you and forthright. All right, so 27 minutes on the seventh take. I've probably taken up too much time here. I love you all. Just uh, hang in there. I know the world is what it is right now, but, you know, it just takes... It takes time. Sometimes it takes a long time. Sometimes it takes a short time. But life is precious. And now is as good of time as any as to work on your heart. And to work on a good practice. To be kinder to yourself and to others. All right. With that, I'm going to sign off. Cliff from Today. Any questions, please be kind and I will answer them in the comments. Thank you. I'll, I'll reply to them. <laughs> All right. Bye.